John Blickman joins me this week to discuss Common Sense Brewing. This is Beersmith Podcast number 226. This is Beersmith Podcast number 226 and it's late November 2020. John Blickman joins me this week to discuss Common Sense Brewing. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3.1 a try. If you have not downloaded the new 3.1 update, grab it now as it includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, add-ons, and more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to Beersmith.com today. Again, that's Beersmith.com. Dot com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back John Blickman, the president of Blickman Engineering. Blickman is the innovative creator of uh, home brewing equipment like the Anvil Foundry, Brew Easy, Riptide Brewing Pumps. Uh, John is a lifetime brewer, frequent guest, and a good friend. John, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Good, good. It's great to be back, Brad. Nice, uh, sunny, brisk fall day here today. It is here and, too. It suddenly we had yeah. this uh, you know, really long, warm fall, and now all of a sudden it's got cold again. Yes, but it feels like fall now. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how are things at Blickman Engineering? Last time I talked to you, I think you were doing really well, right? Yes, things are. Uh, there's a lot of home brewers brewing during their COVID shutdowns, so uh, things have been pretty busy here. It's yeah. uh, it caught us a little bit by surprise. So you know, ramping up, but all the, the customers were pretty darn patient with, uh, us and probably everybody, uh, getting back up to speed after the whole COVID show. So, well, that's good. It's been good. That's good. And, uh, uh, I know you got some new stuff coming out or, or have come out, I guess. Uh, yes, we just announced our, uh, our nano brewing grain mill that is it's a pretty amazing grain mill. We're uh, pretty happy with it. It's got great throughput. Uh, be great for a very uh, zealot home brewer as well. Uh, great crush. Uh, came out with commercial keg washer. And uh, we are uh, uh, just coming out here with uh, uh, some new products for Anvil. That'll be announced uh, later this week. And, uh, also the Blickman G4, uh, should go on pre-sale in the next, uh, few weeks. So, and the G4 is a new set of pots, I guess, or? No, that's a, oh, uh, that's our new, uh, conical fermenter. We oh, did nice. some, uh, teaser ads on them. Um, so we're, uh, we're getting those, uh, here uh, first of next year. So we'll, we'll start doing a pre-order, uh, sometime in December for those. And so some exciting new stuff coming out. And a lot of people don't know you are doing professional brewing equipment now, right? Yes, we really uh, had been for a very long time with our one barrel system uh, doing lots of nanos before nanos was really even a, a thing. And uh, now we focus predominantly on uh, that seven barrel and below segment. And uh, we've got some very price competitive uh, products, great support. We've got uh, Pro Brewer on staff. Uh, to help with anything you need um, and uh, lots of equipment in stock ready to go. Yeah, we went to one of the local breweries when I was up there, uh, you and I, and and it yeah. was all stocked with your equipment. Kind of neat. Yeah, we've got uh, three breweries here in town now that are all equipped with uh, Blickman gear. So Nice. Well, um, today you wanted to talk a little bit about common sense brewing. Uh, let's start with a little bit about what you mean by common sense brewing. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I see a lot of these, well, let me, let me step back when I first got brewing. Sure. Uh, what fascinated me most about home brewing was all the gizmos and gadgets. 
uh, you know, and then, you know, being one of the, you know, people that started, uh, you know, grain brewing back in the early nineties, you know, that was even more equipment and things. So it's been a, um, a f- it's been fun watching the, how the knowledge and everything has increased in this hobby, but sometimes, um, you can take it a little too far or think you have to take it a little too far and, uh, you can kind of overcomplicate things and, um, you know, you'd be better served possibly spending that time focusing on things that have a bigger impact on, uh, the flavor of your beer. But then we all recognize too, at least I do that for some, that's the fun in the hobby is, you know, how can I do these fun, complicated things and how can I accomplish this? And, uh, you know, those sort of things. And that can become fun. But what I didn't want is for people to, you know, come into the hobby and, and think that I have to do all these things. Otherwise my beer is not going to turn out. And give us some examples. What are some of the things, uh, you're talking about? Oh, some like, uh, the, uh, no, no oxygen, uh, brewing, or, you know, mashing, no ox, you know, really, uh, somewhat, I would say getting, uh, you know, super extreme with preventing any oxygen from, uh, getting on your beer, uh, during like keg transfers or bottling, those kind of things. Um, uh, those are just a couple to, to talk about. Some is the, you know, carbonation, you know, how, how beer is carbonated, uh, can, uh, be made pretty complicated when it doesn't really need to be. Those are just a few of the things that we can talk about. Well, let's talk about carbonation first. Um, you know, some brewers do make it a little more complicated than needed. Um, what are some of the easiest ways to really carbonate your beer? The easiest way, and this is the way I recommend for everybody, is the set it and forget it method. It takes, you know, once you've kegged your beer, it really does take, you know, a week for it to really condition and be more towards its peak. Um, you can you know, force it along and get bubbles in it, but you can also get too many bubbles in it. And then you've got dispensing problems on your hands. So get your carb chart out, set your beer to the temperature, uh, that it, uh, that, um, your fridge is going to be, your fridge is controlled at, um, look on the chart, set your regulator to that pressure and wait, uh, seven to 10 days. And it will be hundred percent and perfectly carbonated and the beer will be aged well at that time. And of course, uh, if you, if you are kegging, there's a, there's a whole bunch of ways to do it faster, but they come with some risk, right? Yes. Um, you basically, and, and I'll, I'll touch upon this in the, when we talk about oxidation of beers as well is gases do not, you know, readily mix in with liquids. Um, at least not carbon dioxide or oxygen, um, nitrogen hardly at all, but, um, it takes time and you can speed it along by reducing the temperature and, and by increasing the pressure. So, uh, and that will get more into solution, but there's what they call a saturation point where, um, at a certain, at a given pressure and a given temperature, only so much, uh, carbon dioxide will dissolve in, uh, the beer. And that's what the charts are based off of. What is the, um, uh, the saturation, uh, volumes of CO2 that will go in there. And a volume is, uh, like say your, your, uh, keg is one cubic foot of volume. Um, uh, two and a half volumes would be, you put two and a half, uh, volumes of Cub- cubic feet, you mean, right? Cubic feet. Yeah. Two and a half cubic feet of carbon dioxide at, uh, standard temperature and pressure that they use for measuring volumes usually one atmosphere and room temperature roughly i've seen overseas Uh, they use this grams per liter too as well right yeah yeah. so the whole idea is how much are you putting in probably grams per liter makes more sense yeah i mean you could convert between the two i don't remember off the top of my head what the conversion is but right you know so it takes time for that to happen because it doesn't have a whole lot of surface area it's just the beer on top of the keg um and it takes time so you know there's people that will uh, just sit there and roll and shake the keg um and that exposes the the carbon dioxide to more surface area which you know and some splashing and and then it it gets it um uh to carbonate a little faster. You can even, you know, hear the bubbles, you know, you can hear the CO2 going into the keg as you're shaking it, but you got to sit there for a damn long time and shake it. 
uh, to get that to happen. Um, and I know I some think, people also like supercharge it where you put, you overpressure it basically. Right. So they try to, um, you know, and, and you'll read that on all the forums. Oh, this is what I do. I put it on 30 PSI, you know, for, you know, 12 hours, and then I reduce it down to 20 PSI for the next 12 hours. And then I, you know, put it here and, and then set it and it's good, you know, the next day or, or whatever. There's, you know, many combinations of those. And, and I learned a lot about this trouble is when we were, when we had the, uh, first came out with a beer gun, we'd have people that were just having an impossible time, uh, not foaming. And uh, it 99.9% of the time was, um, I asked them, how did you carbonate your beer? And they said, oh, I set it at 30 PSI or whatever, uh, until it felt carbonated. Right. And then I, uh, I, I just put it right back down to the saturation or the, the regular dispensing pressure. The problem there is you really can't control how much CO2 you're actually getting in because you've exceeded the chart pressure and you just somehow have to magically know when it's time to back off and go back to the regular pressure. And that's very difficult to do. And uh, then when those burrs, I said, the next time carbonate it like this, you know, and I gave them just the, the slow way. Forget yeah. It. yeah. And, uh, that's usually the last we hear of them because that usually takes care of the problem. And that's how we really uh, discovered that that's how a lot of people were, were doing that because everybody's impatient and they want to get their, uh, their beer uh, uh, consumed or tasted quickly and things. We do have a product that we came out with that um, it really is the set it and forget it. But instead of shaking the keg for hours and hours and hours, which can be exhausting, um, uh, we, we increase that surface area by running, pumping the beer over a carb stone and, um, and you don't have to exceed the carbonation pressure, that saturation pressure, the chart pressure, uh, at any time. So you can't over carbonate the beer and mm. that product will get it done in about an hour. Is that the, the uh, quick carb? I think. Yes. It's yeah. called quick carb. Yeah. The quick carb, which uh, you sell, I guess. Right. Right. We've had that out for a couple, two, three years now, I think. Yeah. A few years. And, uh, yeah. And they, they seem to work really well. Um, uh, don't over carbonate the beer. Um, if I'm in a big hurry, I'll use it. Otherwise I just use the set it and forget it method. Yeah. What, what are some of the, uh, symptoms you see on the tap if you do over carbonate? What will, what you'll see is, um, the beer really foaming and, and just pouring glasses of foam and then the beer is flat, you know, and, um, uh, you know, you can keep continue to turn the pressure down, but sometimes that makes it even worse because now you've got so much carbon dioxide in there and now you've got an even bigger change in pressure. So, uh, generally you're going to have pouring problems if you've over carbonated the beer. Yeah. Yeah. So the tap's not going to do what it's supposed to. Right. Um, you're just going to get, it's going to come out and, and just, you know, that carb, that level of carbonation does not like being in that beer and it just comes out as foam. And it's since we're on the topic of filling bottles right off the keg, um, you know, I've had mixed success with this. Sometimes I get a great, you know, shelf stable bottle of beer and sometimes not so much. Do you have any tips for that? Uh, if you're, um, if you're bottle conditioning, I think one of the key things is to make sure you're measuring accurately. No, no, I meant, I meant, I meant filling bottles off the keg directly off, oh, the, off keg. the keg. Oh, yeah, off the sorry. keg. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, uh, not to purposely plug the beer gun, but um, the beer gun is, there's a couple of ways you can go. You can go with a counter pressure filler, um, which you pressurize the bottle and then you slowly release the gas and let the beer slowly, uh, fill up into the bottle and then, um, and then you release the pressure, turn off the beer float, release the pressure, and then you can pull the bottle out of the filler and, um, and cap it. Um, uh, those have been around counter pressure fillers for the long I mean, time. Essentially that's what they do commercially, right? Uh, they have a, they have a counter pressure fill, filling system, right? Uh, yeah. Some, some are, most are counter pressure. Some, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure most of the, like the big Crohn's machines and things. If you, are, yeah. If you go buy a big machine to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, um, what we create, but they can be a little bit complicated, um, to use. They are um, very what, time consuming. I know I, I had one a, many, many years ago and it was, you know, it took a long time to fill a bottle of beer. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you get one of the, the things out of sequence, it, it can spray beer at you and, and you've got to, you know, make sure that it's sealed up against the, 
um, uh, the, the stopper that, you know, so that it, it actually will pressurize and things. Um, uh, that, so then we created the beer gun, which essentially, um, it, it has a, a tube inside of a tube so you can push CO2 to the bottom of the bottle to purge the oxygen out of the bottle. And, um, and then there's a quick acting valve that doesn't, um, cause a big change in pressure, uh, you know, or restriction. It doesn't throttle it like, a you know, like a ball valve would, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the beer can flow in, um, smoothly and slowly, uh, with very little foaming. And, um, and if you get too much foaming, that means you're really going to start losing your carbonation. So you don't want that. Uh, and when the bottle's full, you would draw the stem, uh, give it a quick shot of CO2 and it's all one handed operation, you know, real er- ergonomic and, uh, and then cap. And, you know, as far as if you're losing carbonation, make sure your capper is crimping, um, all the way, mm-hmm. you know, so you just want to make sure, you know, that the ears of the, um, of the crown cap are actually pushed all the way, uh, in that they're not standing out. Cause that can sometimes be the reason is cause you're capper just didn't get the bottle capped all the way um well let's go back and talk about natural bottle conditioning what uh do you have some advice on that as well my big advice there is uh use accurate measurements you know so when it says you know use one cup um if you can get the actual weight uh of it that's the better way to go than uh, than a you know a volume amount um we talk about uh, when you're measuring sugar, yeah. Yeah, when you're measuring your priming sugar, and uh, there, you know, if if you've got a higher alcohol beer, I like I always like to uh, drop a few uh, kernels of dry yeast in there just to make sure that there was enough uh, uh, yeast, uh, fresh yeast that's uh, still in there. If it's been you know sitting for a long time, particularly like with a lager, um, if you get them so that they drop out all these, so that's a little trick you can do. Um, if you're having troubles with them carbonating, it's just drop a few grains of, uh, yeast and dry yeast. Mm. But again, the big thing there is, is knowing what the volume is of your, uh, of the beer that you have in your carboy or bucket fermenter or whatever, knowing that volume and using the appropriate amount of sugar. Um, and, and that's really, that's a pretty simple way to, to always achieve the right, um, volumes of CO2 you want for that beer style. And then again, make sure that your capper's actually working well and uh, crimping properly on your bottles. I want to mention one thing too. I, I ran into this early on when I was uh, just starting out, but make sure your fermentation's done as well. Uh, we, yeah. I, I, you know, a lot of times I write, when I was first started brewing, I, I was rushing things a little bit and, um, you know, I'd bottle it before it was really done. And then I'd end up with kind of the bottle bomb problem. Yeah. And there's the bottle bomb caused by it not being fermented all the way. And then there's the bottle bomb caused by uh, having uh, some microbes in there that then will eat the residual sugars that's left over and overcarbonate. And that's when you get the gushers. So, uh, you know, sanitation, as always, is extremely important. Now, another topic you mentioned was uh, low ox brewing. Um, and I, of course, you want to be really careful with oxygen after you ferment it. But, um, but I know there's a big push now by some brewers to, to, you know, eliminate all the oxygen before you even ferment, right? Yeah, like I've seen, um, uh, I don't know how common it is anymore, but there was a big push at one time uh, to do uh, uh, low ox mashing and, and low ox boiling where uh, you would you would blanket your mash uh, uh, yeah, on, on top of the mash with carbon dioxide or have a, you know, some sort of uh, little uh, piston or something that would slide down in your kettle to cover, you know, to take out any of the headspace and, and uh, all those sort of things. And uh, I, I think that the key thing there to remember is what we were talking about is gases don't like to dissolve in liquids and the higher that temperature is. Um, so it, it's even less and, yeah. you know, you're at atmospheric pressure. So, you know, it, you know, you're not, you know, adding, you know, extra pressure to it. So it's really not likely to oxidize or dissolve very much in there. Plus you've got all the steam. Um, if you've, you know, open your mash and there's, you know, big wafts of steam that will, will come out of your mash ton if you pull the lid off it. And generally that's going to displace a lot of that oxygen anyway. 
I know a couple of years ago I had Charlie Bamforth on, and of course he's a, you know an expert mm-hmm. in these things. And mm-hmm. we talked a little bit about hot side aeration, which is you know can be a risk for some commercial breweries and so on. But um, you know his answer to me when I asked about hot side aeration was it's like you know less than one percent of the problem, and it's one of those problems you really only address after you get everything else in your entire process absolutely perfect. So. Yeah, it's. It- I liken it to you. You've got to do some really dumb things to have that become a, an actual noticeable problem. And, and that's like, you know, excessive splashing or, you know, getting a egg beater in to mix up your, your grains or some crazy thing like that. You know, it's, it's, it's something you have to be almost going out of your way to try to get it oxidized at, yeah. at those kind of temperatures. And, you know, and like Charlie it was really leaning towards was, there are a lot more important things to focus on, like fermentation, cell count, make sure that you're getting the right yeast health, um, all those sort of things, water chemistry, different things like that, that if you don't have those things dialed in, this wouldn't be one on near the top of the list to, to be concerned about. You know, and the whole idea there is, um, you know, like, like I was saying before, if it's just something that you like to just screw around with because it's fun and, you know, you like making uh, gizmos, you like reading about these different things and you just want to do that because it's part of the, the fun part of the hobby for you, that's great. Um, but if you're newer to the hobby, um, don't get paranoid and, and worry about uh, that aspect of it. I would spend more time learning and uh, uh, researching about uh, yeast health and fermentation and uh you know other things like that or or things like ingredients and flavors yes <laughs> you know using fresh ingredients um you know learning uh, about understanding what the flavors of the ingredients actually are right yeah and uh you know i mean just things as simple as you know you know don't uh watch your mash ph because if you have high ph you're going to get an astringent tasting beer yeah. Those are things that uh, do really make a difference in the mash. And um, that's what I would really recommend focusing on. Um, well, one area where I do worry about oxygen is in transfers, particularly after fermentation. Um, you know, it's really easy to introduce bacteria and oxygen into the finished beer. Um, you know, I, I know you've done some work with pressurized transfers and, you know, a lot of these things are in the reach of home brewers now. What are your thoughts on that? You know, if you can, you know, if you have the equipment, uh, to do that. I mean, that's how they do it on the, you know, in the commercial breweries. Um, a lot of it has to do with, cause they're trying to, to save CO2, you know, so they will actually, um, connect the two tops of the, uh, fermenters together, uh, with a hose and then they can drain from one and push the CO2, uh, you know, out of the one, uh, fermenter and back into the one it's coming from. You know, so, uh, you know, that's that's one of the ways they can keep things uh, purged and also transfer without uh, much oxidation pickup. You know, and they're they're using um, instead of, you know, it's not very common that you'll use gravity in a commercial brewery to pump your finished beer into uh, a keg or a bright tank. Uh, so you're using pumps and those pumps are going to splash inside of the fermenter and things. So there it makes sense in home brewing. um I, I, for years, have always just, I store my kegs uh, full of CO2 under pressure, and when I'm ready to use them, you know, I'll just uh, crack the lid open, put the hose down to the bottom, and and slowly fill uh, from the bottom. And, um, you know, and, and again, w- once you get up to the top, uh, you know, I'll pull the hose out. You will have a little bit of oxygen now that is uh, in exposure with the beer, but it's it's not going to instantaneously dissolve and you're not going to end up with beer carbonated with oxygen, you know? So. Right. And typically, the, typically when you're doing that transfer, the, the beer itself will release a little bit of CO2. Uh, yeah. It gives a little yeah. bit of a blanket over it anyways. Right. Right. Just, right. Just because you agitated it when you moved it. Right. And then put the lid back on and then I clear the head space. Uh, I pull the, uh, uh, the uh, pressure relief valve, turn it a quarter turn so that it stays open. And then I, uh, I run uh, carbon dioxide, uh, in the head space for, you know, a few minutes and that discharges any oxygen that's in there. And, uh, then I'll close the relief valve and, uh, pressurize it and get it in the, uh, uh, the cooler. 
But now, since what, uh, since a lot of these new fermenters have the capability to do pressurized transfer, I think some of yours do as well. Um, can you mm -hmm. can you maybe walk us through what that looks like instead? Yeah, I sure can. But you know, stepping stepping back to what I was talking about before, what you don't want to do is have a keg that hasn't been purged with carbon dioxide and then just spray it in there. You know, you can't just dangle the hose over the end and let it splash all the way to the bottom. You really want a gentle transfer. Uh, so you're not exposing it unnecessarily to oxygen. Um, so that's, you know, that's the method I've always used is just the, um, just purge it and then slowly fill it from the bottom and then immediately purge that head space. Um, and that, that works the same thing with bottles where, where you have problems with packaging versus a transfer in packaging that oxygen's stuck in there. Any oxygen you leave in there, it's stuck in there for good, and it's going to oxidize uh, some of that beer. You know, I mean, as much right. oxygen. So that's why you want as little oxygen as you can when you package it. Uh, but when you're in a keg, because you can't, you can't purge a, you know, you can't pull the relief valve on a bottle cap uh, or a or a pop top on a on a can to get the oxygen out. So that's kind of, um, you know, a little bit of the background there. Um, so. Uh, you do mention, and, and you're absolutely right, a lot of the pressurizable fermenters, um, and you don't need much pressure, actually. In fact, you can do it without any pressure if you have uh, gravity available. And, you know, the simple way to do that is, is uh, you know, when you're done fermenting, your headspace is largely going to be filled with carbon dioxide. And uh, what you can do is make sure that your keg is... Um, filled with carbon dioxide all the way, that you've purged it. I take uh, and hook a gas... Uh, my gas up to the liquid outpost and purge it from the bottom down and, uh, you know, purge for, oh, I don't know, uh, three, four minutes. And that will clear the um, keg of uh, oxygen and it's all CO2. And then it's as simple as connecting the uh, drain valve on your kettle to the um, uh, liquid in post. You on mean on the, on the fermenter, I should say. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. On the fermenter. Uh, thanks for correcting that. Uh and then um, you will want to run uh, from your uh, CO2 post uh, up to the top of your fermenter. So mm -hmm. what you've basically done is any, any beer that goes in is going to push that amount of CO2 back up into the other fermenter. So you can act, if you have you know, a difference in elevation, you have the fermenter above the beer, you, it will actually do that without having to, um, uh, to actually pump it or have it pressurized, you know, you can actually just do it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way that you can do it, if they're not at the same elevation is, um, is simply, you know, purge your keg and then, um, uh, just turn on the CO, uh, two pressure on your fermenter. Uh, you don't need much, just a few PSI. couple pounds. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's usually plenty. And, uh, and then, um, uh, you connect that up to your, um, uh, liquid outpost and then on the discharge, what most brewers will do is put a little uh, variable pressure relief valve on the outlet of their um, gas ball lock so that um, you can just slowly release the gas and then that will let the beer flow. Otherwise, if you just open it all the way, it's going to shoot out pretty pretty hard and pretty fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the most common uh, way that uh, you can do that. You can also just use a very small pressure and uh, pull the... Uh, pressure relief valve and turn it a quarter turn so that it stays open and fill your, uh, fill your keg up that way. So you don't really have to make it that complicated and you can do all those closed transfer. And, you know, like I said, even when you're done transferring it that way, I would still, uh, purge that head space of your keg afterwards to get that oxygen out of there because any oxygen that you do leave in the package is going to oxidize the beer. But, uh, going back to your original point, I mean, you don't have to do all this, right? We've been making beer for a long time without absolutely <laughs> without pressurized absolutely. transfers, right? Right. You know, and, and some of the you know some of the concern is okay. Now I'm as I'm draining. If you do it the old way, like I was telling you about, where you've got the um, the uh, uh, the fermenter not under pressure, and you just open up the you know just take the airlock out, for example. Um, now as that's draining, it's pulling in air and potentially pulling in uh, some bacteria with it. So, um, you know, I've never been terribly concerned, uh, about that because I, I drain them fairly quickly 
and you know that CO2 is dropping at the same time that you know the beer is is because it's moving so slowly it's not doing a lot of mixing um you know so that have that co2 is heavier than air so um you know it's it's just that very very top portion and um that would even possibly be exposed for a very short period of time and then it's in the keg and then i purge and that's how it's been done for a long time by home brewers because it's simple and straightforward um but now with you know if you do have the pressure capable fermenters and like i was saying before even if you don't if that's something that you want to um experiment with um you know by all means but don't think that your beer is going to get ruined if uh during the transfer you know you get a little teeny bit of oxygen pulled into your keg yeah because you get it out and you know you're not likely to get a a a tremendous amount um that's that's dissolving during that transfer. So, like I said, we've been doing it for years, right? Works fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, and again, I don't want people to to think, oh, I have to have um, all this equipment so that I can properly keg my beer. No, if not, if you have it and you like to do it, do it. Yeah. Um, but but you know, I just don't like to scare people away from uh, kegging or from the hobby in general because they see people with all these complicated pieces of equipment, all that other stuff. You know, I think, Brad, both you and I made great beer in buckets with holes drilled in the bottom for a mash tun and, and uh, you know, plastic bucket for a, a fermenter. And I, I did uh, that for like 20 years. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I was more the gadget guy. You're more the software guy. Yeah. You know, so obviously I took it, uh, you know, way to the other level because that's, you know, for me, that's the fun in it is all the gadgets and gizmos. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I just don't want to scare people out of the hobby. Oh, um, well, you did it, uh, not exactly related to what we're talking about, but you did an episode earlier on, uh, pressure fermentation with Chris White, uh, and you guys were doing pressure fermentation of lagers. This was, uh, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, I guess. Um, yeah, and I, of course, if you like pressure years ago, yeah. Yeah. Took and if you pressure time. ferment, ferment the lager, I guess it reduced the, in your case, it reduced the esters, uh, for the yeast you were using. Um, so I was wondering maybe, you know, two years later, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that technique you know that's still a great technique to make um if you want to make like a a clean tasting ale like a california you know steam beer if you want to make a um a lager but you don't want you don't have the um uh the temperature control or you don't want to mess around with the temperature control or you don't want to spend the money on the temperature control because maybe you don't do you know a lot of um uh, lagers Um, but you can produce a a pretty close simulation to a traditional lager, uh, fermenting at one to one and a half bars, uh, is what we really found. Um, and you know, that's about 15 to 20 PSI, something like that. Um, and, and it's super simple, um, easy way to go if you have the equipment to do that. Um, now they have, um, these new, uh, Quebec yeast and, um, they do a similar thing. Uh, just with a yeast that uh, can handle higher temperatures and not produce uh, the esters. So, you know, it's just kind of neat to see the different uh, things and how they uh, morph and come along. So, Yeah, and I, w- I will point out, if you're going to do this uh, pressurized fermentation, some of these other things, I think some of the experiments have shown that it is a little bit yeast-dependent too, right? You know, fermenting um, at warm temperatures with with lager yeast, some of them produce more uh, flavors than others. Um. We didn't really notice that. What we did notice is that it um, it did suppress some of the diacetyl that actually kind of rounds out the palate when you mm-hmm. do a, a, a traditional lager fermentation. Um, but then I wasn't trying all sorts of different yeasts. I, we, I think we, what we made was a Hellas, and, um, and we just used all the same uh, yeast. I think it was the White Labs 930, if I remember right. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, it was more the, um, it did make different esters based on the pressure. And since you're fermenting at, at room temperature, um, it, I mean, it makes extremely low levels of diacetyl. Um, but when we did the control, which was the traditional, uh, fermentation at, um, uh, normal lagering temperatures, um, you do get a little bit of that residual, um, esters, uh, present and, um, or I'm sorry, diacetyl present. And, and to me that kind of rounded and softened the, um, just that malt profile. 
it actually, to me, it, it was a little nicer with a little bit of that um, diastole that you'll get with, uh, you know, low levels uh, with some lagers. Well, um, going back to our original topic, uh, you know, you sell an amazing array of equipment. And as, as you mentioned, you're the gadget guy. But I mean, is it possible to get in a point where you have, you know, so much equipment and so many processes that that brewing starts to lose some of its, uh, you know, fun, if you will? Um, I think what I would recommend people to is to always ask yourself, uh, you know, what what is the joy that I take out in homebrewing? Is it the is it the recipe end? Is it the equipment end? You know, is it just, you know, being alone and being in the quiet for four hours while you're brewing? Is it, you know, that I just like to have homemade beer on tap and I really don't care how I make it. Um, you know, those are all different areas. You know, if, if you don't, uh, if it's, if the home beer making isn't the part of it that you like, you just like having home brew on tap, you probably want to stick with extract you know, cause it's, it's faster, it's easier. And, and you can, you know, especially with modern extracts, um, you can make great beer with them. Um, mm-hmm. if you're, you know, somebody who just likes to mess around with all the different ingredients and, and the recipe aspect, you can go for a more simple, you know, all grain system, like some of the all in ones that you're seeing out now. Mm-hmm. Um, Anvil's got one that, that we have. Yep. Uh, but if, if you really like the process part of it and the, and the gizmos and you just like to tweak with the process side, you know, then having that equipment's part of the fun, you know? So it's, it's more just, you know, ask yourself, uh, you know, what, what really am I in this for? And, yeah, I mean, some people get into the gadgets and they're, they're, you know, they do the start building controllers and automating the whole system and right. mm-hmm. you can go crazy actually. Yeah. I made a whole company out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can go nuts. <laughs> yeah. But then sometimes, you know, I'll kick back and I will just, I, I just want to brew old school, you know, uh, sometimes just, just because I just want to get out there and just brew for the day and just have a little, you know, peace and, and quiet. So, well, that brings me back to my follow on question. I know, uh, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen a trend back to smaller brewing systems, probably because, you know, you're not having the large social gatherings and, and, you know, and so on. Um, and I, you know, I have, t- I have trouble sometimes drinking 10 gallons of beer all by myself. So, um, uh, you know, and there's been a big push for these all-in-one systems. I know you've had uh, pretty pretty high orders on your new systems, right? Yeah, the new, uh, we call it the Anvil uh, Foundry is what we call that. And uh, there's a number of them uh, on the market with, you know, varying degrees of uh, features and things. Um, and uh, they're, they're great systems to use. And this is more um, of a, you know, again, like a countertop type system, right? Yeah, or floor, the five-gallon batch size units are more, you know, floor-mounted, uh, you know, and then you lift them up. Some people put them on milk crates or different things like that. Um, but they're, they're small and compact, and um, most run on 120 volts. Um, the foundry runs on um, 240 or 120, depending on what you have, just faster at, at, 100, at 240 volt. Um, but they're, you know, they're quite simple. You can, uh, do them with a no sparge, uh, process, or if you want to, you can sprinkle some sparge water over the top. Um, so you can make it, uh, you know, you can make an all grain batch pretty, you know, pretty, uh, easily, you know, and, in a lot less time than, you know, doing the, uh, three vessel systems, for example. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, those are great systems. We have the uh, Brew Easy, Brad. That's that's the system that you have. I do uh, like it. Yeah, yeah. We have that in a uh, five gallon batch size, ten, twenty, and one barrel batch size. Uh, that's for the we we sell a few of those to the commercial commercial breweries actually. I've but, seen some um, I've seen some uh, small micro breweries using, or I should say, nano breweries really using your one barrel systems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, at home, I've got uh, both a five gallon brew easy and a 10 gallon brew easy that's my uh that's my system of choice actually is the brew easy um and uh you know i like it because it's compact um so i have room for two of them down there uh but i find myself uh doing five gallon batches more because you know i'm you know we're not having you know our kids are out of the house now so i've got a little bit more time to brew so i can brew more often and uh you know we're not having you know the you know all the kids parents over and you know having parties and you know Spreading the homebrew around and yeah, I find my social so. social calendar is a lot uh, more open these days. So yeah, <laughs> with less, the pandemic and everything, far less insane. Yes, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so yeah, so it, and and it has been even before the pandemic, it had been trending down to, back towards uh, five gallon batch sizes. Um, you know, because it was it was kind of uh, all the the um, extract stuff was really kind of lended itself well to five gallon batches, and when people went up to ten gallon batches, mostly because they wanted to do all grain, and uh, it was a lot more work. So well, I'm going to make ten gallons. Uh, if I'm going to go through all that work, it takes the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. And now, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, um, the brewers are going back down to that five gallon mark because there's now equipment that's readily available and, um, and processes that are a little bit shorter than, you know, the old, um, uh, three vessel type brewing, but I still like three vessel brewing too. It's, it's just kind of, you know, that's my therapy, uh, sometimes is just to get out there and, and do a three vessel brew. I do that, uh, here at work. So. But going back to your original point, I mean, you know, simplicity has its own benefits, right? It does, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things you can make it as complicated or as easy as you want to homebrew. Um, you've just really got to, you know, decide, you know, what, what is it you have time for? What is it that you, uh, really want out of the hobby? Um, you know, cause I, I'd have people that had never brewed before and call them saying, okay, I want to get a top of the line, everything, what do I need? And I, and I, I will suggest to them, I'm, I'm, I like money as much as the next guy and I'm happy to sell you whatever you want. But what I would recommend is starting with a, you know, a simple starter kit and see if you actually like brewing in the first place. Cause the last thing you want to do is get into this hobby with the most complicated thing and have a super frustrating time and then just sell it on eBay. Cause you're just frustrated as hell with it all. You know, that's, you know, that's what I, I wouldn't suggest doing is jumping into, um, you know, a real complex system right away. And um, I mean, these, you know, these small all in one systems go for a couple hundred dollars, right. Versus, uh, you know, one of your top of the line, three tier systems is probably yeah. many thousands yeah. of dollars, so, right? Yeah. Our, like our five gallon three tier system, I think is $5,000, you know, and it includes everything. It's, beautiful piece of machinery um and our um the the five gallon anvil foundry is about 450 dollars uh we you know with the recirculation with kit. all the bells and whistles yeah, yeah. so uh right. but still that's uh you know order <laughs> order a magnitude yeah. difference yeah and they're great if, if you want to you know if you do want to go you know you know that you're gonna like this or you've you've brewed with a buddy and you want to go you, you know so you kind of do know that you like the hobby um it's never been easier to go all grain than it, uh, than in the past, uh, than it is with these new all in one systems are just pretty straightforward. Um, you know, so the kind of a blend in between with, uh, the three vessel system, the sparging system and the, um, and the simple all in ones would be the brew easy. So you really, it's, it's about the same amount of time investment. Uh, to brew, uh, you get a little bit better um, word clarity because it's it has a you know a separate uh, mash tun, and um, it's just a nice piece of equipment to work on. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, but it's in there, about in that fourteen hundred dollar range. So, yeah. and that comes with you know full automation uh, on a controller and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, John, I um, uh, want to get your closing thoughts on your topic and. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I, I go back to what I talked about at the beginning. Um, when, you know, you're don't look to complicate things on purpose unless that really is what you like to do and what you're hoping to get out of the hobby is, you know, just a very complicated thing to work on. Like, you know, like you said, Brad, some people like to build these automated temperature control systems because it's fun. It's their therapy. Um, but don't think that, um, you need all that stuff to make uh, good quality beer. Um, you can do that with some very simple, basic equipment. And, um, you know, if if you've gotten to the point where your beer is so awesome that uh, you can't think of anything else to improve, then I would work on some of these, uh, you know, minor tweaks towards the end there uh, that we talked about, you know, the, you know, some of those things because most of those problems you can avoid just by not doing dumb stuff. And, um, you know, so just kind of bear that in mind as you're, uh, as you're uh, looking to change your processes or, uh, get additional equipment or that kind of thing. Yeah. That's really sound advice for life. Uh, you know, don't do dumb things, right? 
Yeah, you know, in general, that that seems to work out pretty good. <laughs> Don't well, John, show up on the Dar Darwin Awards. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, uh, uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. It's great to see you again. Yeah, likewise, Brad. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And again, my guest today was John Blickman, president of Blickman Engineering and Anvil Brewing, uh, makers of high-quality home and professional brewing equipment. John, uh, thank you again. You're welcome, Brad. We'll see you. A big thank you to John Blickman for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're offering access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3.1 Brewing Software a try. If you've not downloaded the new 3.1 update, grab it now as it includes brew improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, new add-ons, and much more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to beersmith.com today. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm -hmm.